Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I know we don't use it very often, but I couldn't help it because I was just so happy. It's so sunny and so warm. It feels great outside. Um, and so we celebrate not only the warm days, but of course the cold days too. Every day is a day that the Lord has made for us to rejoice and to be glad in it. Uh, we continue our study of 1 John today, uh, last week talking about Jesus and his identity uh, given to us by the eyewitness John. Today John uh, reminds us of our identity as children of God and what that means for us as we live our lives every day. Special welcome to guests and visitors who are with us. We ask that you would sign the yellow visitor card that's in the pew in front of you. You can place it in the offering plate when our offering is received. Also, if you have any prayer requests today, fill out one of those prayer request cards, place that in the offering plate as well. Now let's rise and share the peace with one another. Now you may be seated as we continue today. There's a lot of singing within our worship today to continue to celebrate our risen Christ. We begin with our opening hymn, With High Delight, Let Us Unite, hymn number 483. May God bless our worship together. Let us rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. Let us now confess our sin to God, our merciful Father. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We are by nature sinful, and we have not always lived as your thankful and joyful people. We have indeed turned away from one another in our thinking, speaking, and doing. We have done the evil you forbid and have not done the good you demand. We do repent and are truly sorry for these our sins. Have mercy on us, gracious Father. Forgive us all that is past, blot out our sins, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, Direct our lives so that we serve you in true faithfulness. Grant us steadfastness among all the changes of this world and build your kingdom among us here through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn to him. May he keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit and grant you a victorious life on earth, and finally, a triumphant life with him in heaven forever. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As well-loved Easter people, rejoice and be glad. You are free indeed. Amen. Amen. The psalmist writes, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The strains of Easter joy echo through all the services of the Easter season. Each Sunday is a little Easter. For us to celebrate as together, we sing the victory of our God. We are amazed Easter people, and our amazement is best expressed in our songs of joy. One of the oldest hymns in our hymn books is The Day of Resurrection, written by John of Damascus in the 8th century. Together we sing stanza one that celebrates the Passover of gladness. Paul writes, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory of Christ is the lasting source of joy that gives hope to the grieving and assurance to all the faithful. We rejoice as we sing the second stanza of the day of resurrection.
John writes in the book of Revelation, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass, mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. The celebration of the victory of Jesus, the Lamb of God slain for our salvation, goes on throughout eternity. We join in the joyful praise as we sing the third stanza of the day of resurrection. And let us pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And the first reading for the third Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 3. While the lame man, who was now healed, clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's Astounded. And when people saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us as though by, your own, by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive, until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind the love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure." Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous." 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us rise. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that he saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now join together as we make confession of our Christian faith. We use the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated once again. We now sing the sermon hymn, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It, hymn number 594. Thank you.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, children, children of God. Today, our text, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Last Sunday, as we began our sermon series on 1 John, the appointed second reading or epistle reading for the Sundays after Easter, we heard John confidently proclaim and declare Jesus' true identity, that he is both God and man, that he is the one who suffered and died on the cross, and after three days rose from the dead. John declared what he had seen, what he heard, who he touched, the risen Christ. And declares that all who believe in him will not perish but have the victory that he has won for them. So who are you? That's what John is asking in our text. There's many different ways to answer that question. Who are you can be answered based on your gender. It can be based on your occupation or your recreational pursuits. It can be based upon your place within your family unit. Father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, grandparent, so on and so forth. Those are all special designations of our identity. But today, John brings the most important of all our identities forward to us to celebrate and to proclaim to others to live in um, as we go into this life unto life everlasting. Be able to say, I am a child of God. Have that absolute confidence and assurance of this identity. I am a child of God. Now, it is true that everyone can make this proclamation and claim Because after all, everyone is a child of God in the function of God as creator. There is no one who exists without God's purposeful plan, God's design. Everyone's created in his image and likeness. Everyone is a child of God. Although not everyone knows it because they do not believe in the God who has created them and all people. Although we are created by God, we also remember that we are conceived and born in sin. So God has made us. We are actually born as sinners and therefore enemies of God and unworthy to be called his children. But God will not stand for that. God does not want that to be a part of anyone whom he has made identity. He wants us to be his children now and forever. And the only way that that can take place is that he removes sin, the barrier of sin that separates us from him and the judgment of eternal death that comes with our sin. And that's what God does for us. In love and mercy that we would be called children of God, we have been adopted. We have been adopted out of sin and death and declared his children redeemed, the forgiven of God, a designation that we heard in that wonderful hymn that we just sang from our baptism. We have been baptized into Christ Jesus, and to be baptized into Christ Jesus means we are baptized into his death and his resurrection. We're baptized into the cross in the empty tomb. This is how we are adopted and made God's children. For when we were baptized, we received forgiveness for our sins. We received faith in this Jesus and became his children and heirs and heirs of everlasting life. We are children of God by God's grace through faith with an inheritance, as First Peter writes in chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. An inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This is indeed the place where God dwells. There are no more pain and sorrow and suffering anymore. Death has been defeated. The devil has been defeated. And we celebrate this victory forever. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in the United States is? The fastest growing crime in the United States is identity theft. And all of us, I believe, have been victims of identity theft, whether we know it or don't even know it. Georgia reported the most identity theft cases. The medium loss of fraud cases for victims is around $500, and total losses are estimated from identity theft at $10.2 billion. Identity theft through emails, through text messages, through phone calls, people pretending to be someone whom we should trust, who we have a relationship with, but we don't have a relationship with this person or this company. They are liars and they are thieves. And how easily people are prone to this identity theft. How someone will receive an email from someone who, well, they don't know or think they know, and immediately they click on the email and begin an interaction with this person who they believe to be someone they know, and before you know it, they have shared all their information with this person. Before you know it, they have had their life's earnings, savings, been stolen. Their identity has been taken from them. Not only does it happen through email, but phone calls. How often do we have these spam phone calls? Thankfully, we can sort of identify them that way, but still people are picking up the phone, and still people are having conversations, and they're believing the person on the other line and giving all their information out. And the next thing you know, that identity, their identity, has been taken from them. Or even Facebook, how many times we had Facebook friends or even our own page in which, well, I want to let you know that if you get a friend request from me, right? If you get a friend request from me, don't, don't accept it. My account has been hacked. My identity has been stolen. We see that big button that says click, and we're just so quick to click on it without really thinking about what we're doing. Well, we have enemies to our identity as children of God, too, and they are relentless as well, and they are liars, and they are thieves, and that's the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. They want nothing more than to take us away from the inheritance that we have through Jesus. They want nothing more than to remove the perpetual joy that is ours when we die. You might say, how can this possibly happen, knowing that the inheritance is awaiting us and that it's perfect? Why would anyone forfeit that? Why would anyone click on the link? Why would anyone answer the phone call? Why would anybody respond to that email? But that's what Adam and Eve did. In a startling turn of events in the Garden of Eden in paradise, the temptation of the devil was too great for them to resist, even though they lacked nothing. And they clicked on the link. They answered the phone call. They responded to the email of Satan's temptation, and they sinned, and death has come into the world. Our enemies are relentless. The devil, the world, and our sinful nature work to pull us away from God, and that work is through temptation. The temptation, which is to do what God would have us not to do, 
to say what God would have us not to say, to think what God would have us not to think. Because every time we sin, we forfeit our inheritance. We reject God and are under his wrath and judgment. Martin Luther talked about temptations on the left side and right side, temptations that happen in sickness, poverty, and dishonor. You know, when the times are difficult, it's easy to fall into temptation. He says, especially when our will, plan, and opinions, counsel, words, and deeds are rejected and ridiculed. This can lead to laziness or to anger, hatred, or impatience. We can recognize how easy we can fall into temptation when this can happen to us when life is difficult. And Luther also talks about temptation from the right side, uh, a trial from prosperity. It is especially strong when people let us have our way, praise our words, our counsel, when they esteem us. This test leads us to unchastity, lust, pride, greed, and vainglory, all that appeals to our human natures. Temptations abound. They come at us each and every day, more enticing than the next, wanting us to follow their ways, the ways of darkness, to have us to sin. When we have the designation as a child of God, we are not children of God because we're perfect. That's all too well apparent in our lives. Although we work hard at striving in righteousness and obedience to God's word, we all fall short. No one is perfect, not even one. But we are children of God because we are forgiven. We are children of God because by grace through faith, Jesus has saved us. And we rely on his mercy and his loving kindness every day. And he grants it to us. He gives it to us in abundance. When temptations come our way and we see that big, you know, bright click on this button sign. When we get the phone call, when we get the email of someone who we think we know, but uh, who knows if we know them or not. But we're so enticed by it that we'll click on it. We find ourselves losing our identity, find ourselves lost. We turn to the Lord, and He forgives us. We turn to the Lord and, and ask that He will remove our transgressions from us, and He does so. He restores us as His children to live again and again for Him. And as we live and again and again for him, as we surround ourselves with his word and are strengthened by the Lord's Supper and fellow Christians, we become more discerning when it comes to our enemies. We become better prepared when it comes to temptations. I heard recently how families are creating a, a special word, a safe word within their households. So that if someone is claiming to be one of their family members or extended family members and wants to deceive them, wants to, be, wants to rob them of their identity, that this safe word is that which prevents it. Tell us our safe word. If they don't know it, you hang up. You don't answer the email. You don't answer the text. You don't push on the button. As we grow more and more in God's word, the light of the Lord, the light of truth, shines in the midst of the darkness, shines in the midst of the temptations that we face. We're able to discern them and see them for what they are. This is not God speaking. This is not what God would have me to do. And so we reject our enemies. We reject their lies, and we don't succumb to losing our identity as a child of God. We become more and more attuned 
with God's word and the direction for our living. Always remembering that we are children of God by his forgiveness. To live in that strength and assurance every day and to know that our inheritance is secure through Jesus. So who are you? There's many ways to answer that question. John would have us to boldly and confidently say, as we can say and do say, I am a child of God. I am forgiven. And my inheritance is secure. Amen. And now may the love of God, which far surpasses our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he does return in glory. Amen. And our response to God's word, our offerings are received. Many hymns in the hymnal contain the words joy, joyful, joyfully, and rejoice. One of these, Rejoice, O Pilgrim Throng, was inspired in part by Psalm 20, verse 5, a psalm of David, which exhorts, May we shout for joy over your salvation, and in the name of our God, set up our banners. As a superscript to the poem from which the hymn text was taken, our author Edward Plumtree wrote, in the name of God, we set up our banners, rejoicing in our salvation. We sing the first two stanzas of Rejoice, O Pilgrim Throng. Let us rise. And let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the whole church, that the message of salvation may joyfully be proclaimed throughout all the world and the forgiveness of sins be celebrated around the globe. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the nations of the world, including our President Joe Biden and Governor Tony Evers, that governments would be a source of blessing to those who are governed and that oppression in all forms may be hindered, bringing a sense of security and well-being in every place. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for ourselves in this amazing season of our Lord's great victory.
that we may truly be Easter people all year long, including our members in the spotlight, Brian and Linda Krieger and Casey, Kevin and Megan Reinhold and Adeline, Bruce and Lori Steinecke, McKenna Grodenheis, and Adriana and Canon Gerard. Also, we give thanks for the, the wedding, uh, uh, joining of husband and wife of Owen and Anna Hassler yesterday. Help us to radiate the light of Christ in our homes, workplaces, and communities. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who serve us through their callings, especially those who deal with special challenges or dangers on a regular basis, including police officers, firefighters, and other emergency personnel. Also, we remember at this time the military forces of our nation, those stationed both at home and abroad, whose efforts serve to defend our nation in challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, hear we pray for those with special concerns and needs this day those who are hospitalized, those recovering from surgery, those with cancer. We pray for those in our hearts, Al Killian, Kitty Brandt, Joshua Rene, Jenna Whaley, Judy Becker, and Julie Corpin. Those who grieve, the unemployed and underemployed, the chronically ill and shut in, and all others whose needs are known to us. Bless them with your presence, gracious Father, that they may have a sense of purpose in their lives, and find strength and hope for each day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Into your hands, O Lord, we lift up all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, confident that you hear us for his sake alone. Amen. Amen. The hymn text of Edward Plumtree, an English clergyman who lived in the 19th century, reminds us that we are part of a much larger assemblage of those who praise God, including all the angel choirs and all the saints on earth. The hymn writer sees God's people as part of an endless procession, steadfastly proceeding from the darkness of the world to the brightness of heaven. In the final stanzas, the hymn celebrates the pilgrims reaching their final heavenly destination by God's grace and gives praise to the Lord whom we adore. Together, we sing stanzas six and seven of Rejoice, O Pilgrim Throng. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. And taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You. you may be seated.
Let us rise. And let us pray. Grant that your Son's body and blood, O Lord, which you have given us to eat and to drink, may abide in us, and let no stain of sin remain in us, whom this pure and holy sacrament has refreshed. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Ann Grit will come up to the lectern. She's going to give you uh, some news upcoming for a garage sale. While she is coming up, uh, you noticed as you came in, or if you didn't notice, there's a brewer sign up as well. They're playing great, uh, but the game's not till August, but still, let's hold on. Um, so sign up for that. Uh, there'll be a bus trip, and I uh, want to fill it up as soon as possible. Also, um, we are going to reintroduce uh, ushers and greeters uh, for all three services. Uh, there's a binder um, on the pedestal there on your right as you leave. Um, you can sign up for Thursday, 8, 10, 30. We're going to populate a list, and then we'll uh, schedule you accordingly. Uh, so keep that in mind. Ann? Good morning. Good morning. Late last year, our church established a hospitality committee, of which I'm the chairperson, and our primary purpose is to promote fellowship outside of our worship and Bible study times. So you might see some events popping up throughout the year, and we encourage you to attend so that we can continue to lift each other up and um, get to know each other more personally. So this leads me into something new that we're going to be trying this year, which is a rummage sale. And the proceeds from the rummage sale are going to go to our youth to help defray the cost of the national youth gathering. So we're asking you to challenge yourself, challenge uh, others that you might know to gather things that are in good working order, um, clean clothes, toys, tools, um, jewelry. Don't forget the jewelry, please. <laughs> and we would like you to bring them to the church. Um, just ring the buzzer and Nancy can let you in. We're gonna gather things until the end of the month, but please, if you would give us proper time because it's gonna take some time to mark all of these items. We are gonna open the rummage sale up to the public as well, so that's gonna be another opportunity to get people to come into uh, Good Shepherd and see what we're all about. So um, make us proud, if you would, and, and gather as many things as you can and drop them off here. Um, I think in the gym, we're going to, I'm not really sure, <laughs> stay tuned on that. So um, May 4th and 5th, if you'd mark your calendars, we'd love to see you come. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. If you have any questions, talk to Ann, call the office. Nancy can uh, help you with any questions you have. But yeah, it should be a, a wonderful opportunity. We know we have plenty of stuff. Now it's time to, you know, let that stuff go. It's a good thing. Uh, and it goes to a great cause, our youth group. One thing, uh, Anne, just to uh, give another highlight why this is a really good idea, is that when you bring your stuff, it doesn't come back home with you <laughs> at all, right? It's going to be picked up by someone else. So that is a real bonus with this. I think that's an enticing thought process that, you know, you bring it, it's gone. So it goes to someone who is in need, and it goes to help a raise uh, money again for our youth group. So keep that in mind as we go forth. Well, let us rise as we continue our service uh, and conclude it. Uh, we do have Sunday school ages three and up. Uh, following our service today, the adults are in the community room as we can talk about uh, confession and absolution and that uh, wonderful gift of forgiveness that God gives to us. So we go forth with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, grant you his everlasting peace. Amen. Amen.